Good morning, everyone. Today is September 8th, 2022, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food project founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in the spring of 2020. Every Thursday morning, Jean Lawler, Sarah Agamiri, and I, along with Natalie, host another cutting edge webinar, things of interest to mediators, arbitrators, lawyers, and really anybody who negotiates as part of their daily life and, and living. There's no charge for these great webinars. Rather, we ask people to contribute to a food bank if they like what they see. And every week, one of my favorite parts of the webinar is when we announce the running total, the total amount of contributions of which we are aware that people have made to food banks all around the world in honor of our wonderful speakers. And I am delighted to announce that our running total up until now, people have contributed $311,085.75 to food banks around the world in honor of our great speakers. We thank our speakers and even more so, we thank the wonderful members of our audience for being so very generous. Today, we're going to take a look into the sometimes mysterious world of litigation finance, find out what that's all about and what we really need to know about it. And there's nobody better able to explain this to us than my old friend, Andy Lundberg. Andy and I first met in law school a few years back. We were both uh, students at Harvard Law School at the same time. Andy went on to practice law for many years at Latham and Watkins doing policyholder side insurance coverage work. He was the winner of many awards and many significant lawsuits. He also held a variety of administrative positions in the firm. Now he's moved to the world of litigation finance, where he's a managing director of Burford Capital, one of the premier companies in the litigation finance field. And he also serves on the American Arbitration Association's panels of arbitrators and mediators. So please continue to think of him in that regard as well. Andy, why don't you tell us a word or two about the food bank to which you would like people to contribute if they're in a position to do so? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, pleasure to be here. And thank you, uh, everybody out there in Radio Land for, uh, for joining us this morning. Yeah, my uh, charity of choice is my, my local Los Angeles Regional Food Bank which is a uh, really an impressive organization now in its 50th year uh, in Southern California, serving on the order of 800,000 people a month uh, in various parts of Southern California and in various uh, uh, states of need. Really an amazing organization and one that's uh, been the, uh, the focus of a kind of a fun little friendly competition among many Southern California law firms, uh, which uh, some years ago started a little program called Food from the Bar, uh, in which uh, firms compete to raise uh, the largest amount of money uh, in donations for the, uh, the LA Regional Food Bank. So uh, I'm happy, even though I'm not in a law firm anymore and not, uh, I don't have somebody putting the bite on me uh, in my, uh, my partner capacity, I'm happy to continue to uh, uh, support the, uh, the LA Regional Food Bank. And I hope you'll all uh, joining me and uh, spreading some love their way. Beautiful. Thank you. And we've posted, Natalie's posted, the URL for the food bank in the chat. We hope people will contribute if they are able. Welcome, Andy. We're so happy to have you here. You know, our audience is pretty familiar with what a litigation partner in a big law firm does, but people probably are not very familiar with what a senior lawyer at a legal finance company does. Can you give us a thumbnail about what your work week looks like? Um, I basically operate in three silos at uh, Burford. First, I'm a member of the uh, nine member commitments committee, which is essentially our investment committee, the committee that decides which matters we will uh, finance. So I get a look at every deal that we are thinking about uh, making a commitment to. Second, I'm, uh, I guess you'd call it a brand ambassador, uh, introducing uh, law firms and, and uh, companies to the legal finance landscape. Um, and third, I'm uh, uh, a worker bee on uh, individual opportunities that we're looking at and on individual cases that uh, that we have in our portfolio that may uh, where I may be able to add some uh, some value often on insurance coverage cases since that was my background in practice. Okay, so let's turn to the substance of things. 
I know that I'm not as familiar with litigation finance as I should be, and a lot of other mediators may not be as familiar with litigation finance as they should be, litigation finance being a relatively new phenomenon. So let's do, let's do a little litigation finance 101, shall we? That gets our audience up to speed on just what we're talking about when we talk about litigation funding in 2022. There's no shame in not getting up the learning curve on litigation finance, even in 2022. I, um, I can, can relate to that as, as a practicing lawyer. I didn't have really any substantial exposure to legal finance uh, in connection with the many cases I handled as a plaintiff side lawyer. Uh, when I was in practice, uh, I wish I had, would have given me a lot more options uh, in structuring uh, those engagements and um, therefore probably would have been a, a big aid in developing business. But um, better late to the party than not invited uh, at all for all of us. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about how legal finance works, and maybe um, uh, at the same time, and maybe more important, uh, how it doesn't work. Uh, there are um, some recurring major misunderstandings about the nuts and bolts of legal finance that lead people to suppose things are happening that aren't actually happening. And I think it's it's helpful to correct those misimpressions. What's actually happening? Yeah, at the, at the most general level, uh, what legal finance firms do is to uh, underwrite legal risk. So what does that mean? The most common risk that we underwrite is, and the most familiar one uh, to most people, is the risk of prosecuting a claim unsuccessfully. Uh, that is the risk of spending money to litigate a case and ending up out of pocket rather than in the money. In, in the most our most popular and, and common uh, incarnation, we finance the legal fees incurred in prosecuting a claim in court or in arbitration. So, Andy, when you say we finance legal fees, does that mean that you work with a plaintiff who wants somebody else to pay its legal bills? Or are you working with a law firm who wants you to pay it for the work it does for its client? Who's, who's your client? Who's your counterparty when it comes to financing legal fees? Both. Litigation funders invest uh, both with parties and with law firms. Sometimes. So in the former instance, say a company has a case that it wants to pursue using its regular counsel or perhaps some other um, special counsel with expertise in the particular area involved. The company may not have the cash to pay those lawyers by the hour, or it may have the cash, but prefer to be using that cash on R&D or marketing or otherwise uh, building its business rather than paying lawyers and risking it on an uncertain litigation outcome. But suppose uh, that company and, and suppose the lawyers that company wants to use uh, aren't interested in taking the case on a contingent fee basis. So um, we'll fund the prosecution of the case on an hourly rate basis, uh, although we may ask the law firm to keep a little skin in the game one way or another. Um, so that leaves us taking on the litigation risk that the client and the lawyer both don't want by assuming the cost of prosecuting the case. Uh, in other instances, uh, we'll have a law firm that has an opportunity to pursue a case uh, or a group of cases on a partial or complete contingency fee basis, but doesn't have the appetite uh, for taking on all that contingent risk itself, uh, or it's, it's comfortable uh, with, the, with the level of risk, but it just doesn't have the capital on hand to litigate uh, several big cases uh, for you know, the, the several years that big cases could take. Uh, it needs to pay the associates, pay the staff, pay the rent, hire the experts, and it just may not have the, the cash on hand to do all that. So in a situation like that, we'll be the law firm's risk sharing partner. So they can offer contingency terms to their clients, but have predictable cash flow and uh, a floor underneath uh, the risk they're taking uh, in, uh, in pursuing those cases. Um, as, as, I, as I suggest there, sometimes um, we'll do this on an on a individual case basis, but um, what we prefer and what the trend is toward is uh, so-called portfolio financing, where we invest in a group of cases uh, that a company or a firm is prosecuting, uh, and we fund all of them. Uh, our investment is, in those cases, is cross-collateralized across all the cases. So a loss in one doesn't necessarily mean a loss uh, on the overall investment. And uh, of course, by doing that, that reduces our risk 
and accordingly reduces the risk of, uh, or the cost of our capital to the company or the firm that we are uh, working with. Andy, can you give some examples of the kind of portfolios of cases you're talking about? Are those mass tort cases? What kinds of cases are they? They are commercial litigation funder. Uh, we don't do um, bodily injury cases. We don't do um, uh, divorce cases. Uh, we, uh, we generally focus on, uh, typically on cases that involve <coughs> two business entities that are uh, going at it. Sometimes uh, two business titans uh, against each other, sometimes uh, more of a David and Goliath situation. But the areas that we, uh, we frequently find ourselves in uh, include uh, intellectual property, uh, patents, and so forth. Um, antitrust, uh, we do a considerable amount of work in the, uh, in the international financial uh, treaty arbitration space uh, and all sorts of international commercial arbitrations, investor state arbitrations, that sort of thing. And just the entire run of, um, of commercial disputes that you see arising out of contract or business courts. When you talk about absorbing the, the cost of prosecuting cases, do you finance only the lawyer's fees? Do you cover court costs, uh, experts, all that sort of thing as well? Yeah, we'll, we'll finance uh, at any or all of, of the above. So, for example, some law firms are, uh, who work on contingency are happy to keep the risk that they won't recover on the time they put into a case, but they don't want to don't want to go out of pocket on expenses and costs. Uh, they don't want to pay expensive experts litigation support vendors and all that other stuff. So we might um, just finance uh, costs for uh, a case or a portfolio of cases uh, with, uh, with a firm like that. Uh, other firms um, and companies are looking to share uh, both the risk on uh, legal fees and on uh, out-of-pockets and uh, we'll, we'll finance both and sometimes we'll just finance, uh, finance the lawyer's fees. So when you agree to finance a case, there's a possibility that the case will be adjudicated and will be a loser. What happens if a case is a disappointment or is lost or doesn't generate enough proceeds to pay back what you've invested in your costs or fees? Uh, the funder bears the loss. Our investment uh, in a case uh, or portfolio cases is uh, not a loan. Uh, we, are not a, uh, we are not a commercial lender. Uh, uh, it's our investment isn't secured by the all the assets of the plaintiff or all the assets of the law firm we're doing business with. Uh, nobody is writing personal guarantees to us. Uh, it is a uh, it's strictly a non-recourse uh, financing. Uh, so the, the counterparty has no exposure to uh, to us in that uh, unfortunate event, and uh, the. Uh, uh, no recovery in the case means no return uh, to the funder, either of its investment or the premium it was open to receive. Yes, so, so you're sort of in the situation of a typical contingent fee lawyer. No recovery, no, no fee. Yes, in a very general sense, uh, the, the sense that it's a non-recourse transaction or relationship. Uh, the funder, like the contingent fee lawyer, uh, bears the risk that the case is unsuccessful. You might say, and this is the metaphor I use often, you might say that what litigation finance does is take your classic contingent fee lawyer who both litigates the case and also finances it, takes the risk on it, and we cut that contingent fee lawyer in half, and we send the lawyer half of it down to court to litigate the case and report back uh, on how it's going and how it turned out, and we replace the, the financier half of that lawyer with a professional a funder who pays the bills and uh, bears the ultimate risk of, uh, of loss on the case. I mean, of course, there are differences uh, between us and a contingent fee lawyer, uh, many differences. We don't practice law for one, obviously, but um, in terms of the structure of the, uh, of the financing, uh, for example, a typical contingent fee uh, arrangement, of course, is structured as a percentage of the, uh, the ultimate gross recovery that the lawyer takes 25 or 33 percent or more of the judgment uh, or settlement or takes takes percentages on a sliding scale depending on the timeline and so forth. Whereas um, our financings are often uh, structured instead by reference to a multiple of our investment in pursuing the case rather than a, than a, a percentage of the recovery. But uh, of course, both contingent fee lawyers and litigation financiers 
and have essentially an infinite number of ways to structure uh, the financing of the case. So um, we're just talking very generally here. Is there a typical or standard way, Andy, that you do these financings, a typical deal? Yeah, I can, I can give you an example uh, and we can sort of work through it. Uh, but I'd stress that particularly at the uh, upper end of uh, legal finance, where we're talking about eight to nine to 10 figure amounts of dispute, it's a very uh, bespoke business. So uh, rarely do any two deals have exactly the same structure, but I can, I can give you an idea of, of the parameters involved. Let's suppose that our old friend from law school, uh, ABC Corporation, uh, has a breach of contract case that it wants to bring against its trading partner, XYZ Corporation. <clears throat> uh, ABC wants to hire Mega Law, which is an AMLA 10 firm that it, is usual, it usually uses as its outside counsel, wants to hire Mega Law to, to bring this case. And the case is going to be costing about $10 million uh, from filing to, uh, to verdict. Uh, now, uh, in, in this case, uh, ABC is, uh, because of XYZ's breach, ABC isn't bringing in any current revenue, so it can't afford Megalaw's um, hourly rates, which are uh, lofty. And uh, Megalaw, on its part, doesn't want to take the case on a contingency. Uh, it's not because it doesn't like the case, but it's just not interested in, in uh, being a risk-taking uh, entity. So um, the best mega law will offer may be say, a, you know, a 20% discount movement of the discount or even a premium if the case is a winner. But basically the, the, the lion's share of that legal bill is looking for somebody to pay it and the client can't pay it and the law firm doesn't wanna take the risk on it. So um, a litigation funder uh, arrives on the scene and does its diligence. Um, and if the funder likes the case and likes the budget, uh, it might agree to pay mega laws uh, discounted bills for fees and costs as incurred up to that full $10 million budget. Um, and a typical structure for the funder's return might be that um, out of the proceeds of the case only, uh, the funder gets back like, the amount it's deployed under the financing, the $10 million, plus uh, possibly single digit multiplier of that investment uh, and or uh, a percentage of the gross recovery uh, and or some uh, interest-like component based on the time uh, the case takes to resolve. And, and whether it's one or two or all three of those uh, uh, structures or a combination of them, as I say, is, uh, is very much, uh, there's a lot of flexibility in that. Um, but that's, you know, that's generally the notion is the funder deploys X dollars and gets back its X dollars plus a premium referring to either the you know, what X is or some uh, some other variable. So let's talk about the handicapping or underwriting of the cases. There must be a tremendous due diligence process that goes in before you invest sums of those magnitudes. How does the underwriting or handicapping of the cases or groups of cases work? Does it differ from what a contingent fee lawyer does? The answer is yes and no. Uh, I think it certainly, um, a funder's process, diligence process looks uh, to many, if not all of the same variables a contingent fee lawyer's uh, diligence or evaluation process does, but uh, it, it, uh, it, may, it, it probably looks at them in a different way and in a, a different level of detail. I can't um, talk about any of the, uh, the modeling or analytics that Burford uh, uses. Obviously, that's our, our secret sauce that we think sets us apart from, uh, from other, other companies in our space. But speaking very generally, I think um, commercial funders do is, is, is a bit more sophisticated and data-driven look at the same parameters um, a lawyer, contingent fee lawyer, or a, or a client considering filing a lawsuit and funding it itself would look at uh, the legal merits, how solid a case is this, uh, the process risks, uh, what law will apply, uh, what court are we going to be in, what judge is going to uh, hear the case. Uh, if it's already filed, you know that. If, if it isn't, you don't. Uh, what's the jury pool like in the, uh, in the likely jurisdiction? Uh, the duration risk, uh, how long it's going to be until uh, the funder sees a return on its investment. That's a very important variable given how long some commercial lawsuits and arbitrations can last these days. Uh, the credit risk, uh, both of our counterparty 
uh, and of the opposing party. We, um, we want our counterparty, the, the party that we're financing, um, to, to more likely be, <laughs> be still with us uh, at the end of the case, uh, rather than being a, uh, a bankruptcy state where we find ourselves you know, in, a, uh, in a room full of, uh, of creditors competing for the, uh, uh, the leftovers. Uh, and and same to, by the same token, we look at the credit worthiness of the, uh, the opposing party in the litigation we're going to finance because we don't want to get a, uh, uh, you know, $500 million judgment against somebody who can't pay it. So um, a lot of diligence goes into the, uh, the, the, the credit risk of the transaction. Um, we look at uh, the resources and the motivations of the opposing party. Is this going to be uh, a case against a sort of a rational economic actor, or is there some some animus or some history or some corporate uh, personality of the defendant that leads us to think it's going to be uh, orienting itself towards delay and inflicting a lot of uh, a lot of additional expense? Uh, and we look at uh, the quality of the lawyers on both sides of the case. Invest in cases that are brought by lawyers that we are confident can win them. Uh, and uh, we evaluate the, uh, the cut of the jib of the lawyers on the other side to see if we can gain any, uh, any optimism or pessimism about how easy or hard it's gonna be to win the case. So uh, that's, you know, that's kind of the laundry list of, uh, of issues we look at. And there's of course a million and one, um, you know, uh, unique features of every case that, uh, that may come into play. So Andy, let's talk about how it plays out in the mediation process. And First, I want to ask, you deal in eight, nine, ten figure cases, which are wonderful cases to mediate, but let's face it, there's not all that many of them. Is it possible that litigation funding could be at play in smaller stakes cases if they're potentially part of a portfolio like mass torts, pharmaceuticals, things of that nature? Perhaps not by Burford, but, but by other funders? Uh, the, the litigation finance uh, business is, um, as, as, as many businesses are, is, uh, as the legal business is, is segmented. So there's a, there's a sort of a top tier uh, that deals with large commercial cases with, you know, AMLO 100 law firms on both sides uh, much of the time. And, uh, you know, a lot of bet the company uh, exposure, um, or bet the product exposure or what have you. Then there's uh, what, uh, most of us call the middle market, which is um, cases that may be in the in the six to seven figure range, uh, worth fighting about, worth fighting about with good lawyers, um, but uh, not um, not necessarily uh, ones that can support the uh, the level of um, of uh, infrastructure that a that a Burford or or one of its uh, peers uh, would support. And then there is a, a a booming business in what's called consumer. Uh, Legal finance, where uh, you know if you've got a if you got a forty or fifty thousand uh, dollar beef uh, with a small business, or uh, uh, you have a personal injury case uh, that's worth you know six figures, uh, there's uh, plenty of plenty of activity in that space where uh, where a, a claimant can find support uh, for their uh, for their case. And you know at the, at the lower at the lower ends, of course, it's 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 much more of a of a uh, kind of a, Form, form transaction, there's much less uh, bespoke underwriting and structuring. Let's talk about how this plays out in mediation because litigation uh, funding, litigation finance could be anywhere. From the standpoint of parties coming to a mediation, does it change the mediation process much, if at all? And if it changes the mediation process, how do you think it does so? Well, as, as a general proposition, I don't think it, it changes um, the, the, the litigation dynamics or the settlement dynamics. Um, of course, every case is different in terms of the economic, both the plaintiff and its lawyers and the defendant and its lawyers are dealing with. Um, some plaintiffs and some lawyers and some defendants have a lot of cash, some have none. Uh, you know, uh, a number of the ways, um, uh, both contingent fee agreements and uh, litigation finance agreements can be structured uh, is, is infinite. So the dynamics are, are, are really all, all over the map. But uh, the bottom line, I think, is that um, as with the involvement of contingent fee lawyers themselves, the involvement of uh, litigation funders just means the plaintiffs and possibly other lawyers uh, have access to more resources than they would otherwise. And so assumptions about 
a plaintiff's ability to continue to fight and continue to prosecute the case, the judgment, uh, are uh, may, may be subject to a little more uncertainty than they were before litigation funders arrived, but uh, that, that uncertainty has always been there and will always be there. So if a defendant is curious as to whether litigation funding is behind the scenes, how can they find out? Well, generally they can't. Um, with, with few exceptions, courts hold that litigation financing and litigation financing agreements uh, just aren't relevant. Uh, and and so are discoverable. Uh, they don't bear uh, on the resolution of any any material uh, issues in the case, and therefore they're they're held to be uh, generally not discoverable. When would you want to keep it a secret? Probably the principal one is um, just to just to avoid uh, the kind of discovery and motion practice sideshows that can develop when uh, a party decides that he wants to complicate and delay things for tactical reasons or thinks that can somehow figure out a way to make hay out of the fact that a funder is interested in the case. Um, you know, we, we really don't like the financing of a case to become part of the case uh, when it doesn't have any relevance to it. Um, for, among, among other reasons, that just, just makes the case more expensive if we're paying the bills for it. We don't want to uh, you know, engage in a sort of a, a, a sideshow about uh, our involvement in, uh, in the case uh, in the sense that we, we are providing uh, financing for it. And the courts have, have agreed many times that, again, financing just isn't relevant to anything in, in most cases. So uh, it's, it's really just to, to keep financing just from, from becoming an expensive distraction. Now that we've resolved that one, let's take up another one on tipping your hand or reading between the lines. If you take a look at the posts on LinkedIn of some lawyers who are partners in law firms that prosecute patent infringement cases, they tout themselves as being willing to work with litigation funders. And some I know have even moved firms because they wanted to be with firms that were more hospitable to working with litigation funders. So is it sometimes the case that the presence of a particular law firm representing a plaintiff is a way tipping the hand or acknowledging that a funder is involved, akin to the way that the presence of some firms in the world on the defense side indicate that particular insurance carriers may be involved? Yeah, it's, it's uh, an interesting question. I guess, uh, I guess uh, you could say all else being equal, maybe uh, it would make it a wee bit more likely that a, a given case was financed if you were uh, dealing with a firm like that. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think it's, it's going to be a very good um, indicator. Uh, the fact that a firm appears in, in one or more finance cases uh, or regularly uses funding is, is, I think, hard to extrapolate into a conclusion that the firm works only or mostly on finance cases, and therefore that any case it files is probably financed. Um, for one thing, a lot of time, um, the the, the party getting the financing is the law firm, it's the client. Um, you, don't, you don't know uh, just because uh, you know, mega law is, uh, is working on a finance case. You're, if, if you know that fact, you don't know whether it's the client or the firm that has, has financed the case. Um, and um, so that's, that's one thing that makes it not a very good proxy. Uh, and of course, a firm uh, could be financing a big portfolio of plaintiff side cases, but still be doing most of its work uh, on um, uh, plaintiff cases by the hour. Um, so there certainly are some firms that I think are, are known to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, finance, fin financier partners uh, more than others are. But I think it's, um, you know, and, and on the margins that might might make you more suspicious about whether the case that you are litigating against that is financed, but I, I don't think it's a very good, uh, very good litmus test. Is it sometimes the case, Andy, that the law firm does not know that the client is using litigation finance? Uh, I think that's, that's uh, unusual, but it, uh, it can't happen. Okay, so let's talk about disclosure a little more from the perspective of defendants. It's standard practice when a defense is financed by insurance, standard practice for that to be disclosed through court rules, discovery, interrogatories, or whatever. 
So would not defendants uh, on the flip side of that coin sometimes complain that not disclosing the existence of funding on the plaintiff side or disclosing only its existence but none of the details about it isn't fair? Because after all, if the insurance coverage has to be disclosed on the defense side, why not the funding arrangement on the plaintiff side? Yeah, that is, uh, that is certainly a regular um, subject of debate, and you could spend uh, even weeks and months reading, uh, reading point counterpoint on that uh, on the web. Um, I, I think the answer is it's, it's not really uh, unfair, and, and courts have certainly said this uh, in, in, uh, in written opinions. There's a reason for that asymmetry, and it, uh, I think it goes probably to the biggest misconception people have about litigation finance. Uh, the difference between an insurer's role and a litigation funder's role is that in virtually every case in which the insurer covers or potentially covers um, a defendant's liability, uh, and I was an insurance lawyer, so I'm not making this up, in, in virtually every uh, covered uh, defense, the insurer has a contractual right uh, to, in one way or another, control whether and on what terms that case can be settled. Uh, it may have an express right to settle over the policyholder's objection. Uh, it may have the right to consent or hold consent to settlement. It may have a so-called uh, hammer clause that uh, essentially penalizes the policyholder if it refuses to settle. But insurers generally have a great deal of control by contract over whether and on what terms a defendant may insure will settle a case. And in contrast, litigation funders don't have the right to control the settlement of cases they finance. Um, they can't insist that the plaintiff settle at a given figure and no lower. Uh, they also can't veto the plaintiff's decision to settle at a given figure and not higher. Uh, and they don't have control over litigation strategy and tactics either. Uh, all of that is uh, nor that, that non-control uh, of, of the, the funder is, is normally spelled out very expressly in the financing documents to put both the plaintiffs and their lawyers' minds at ease, uh, that they still have complete control over the conduct of the case and settling it. So um, comparing litigation funders uh, to insurers in terms of the, the fund they have on the scale is, is, uh, is not a good comparison. The insurers are in a completely different um, part of the universe in that respect. So is that why litigation funders sometimes don't show up at mediations, even though they may have a tremendous stake in the outcome of the case? Just like, uh, just like it does in a non-finance case, the plaintiff always has the say over whether on, and on what terms the case uh, settles or doesn't settle. So Andy, you're sitting back there, you've got millions of dollars riding on the result. You just say to the plaintiff, you go handle the mediation, give us a call afterwards, and let us know how it comes out. Uh, uh, how can you be so passive in it? Yeah, it uh, might seem it's sort of like the, the litigation equivalent of, of watching the Super Bowl when you have a, a you know, $10 million bet down on it, and all you can do is just sit there while the, the coach uh, plays. Uh, it's, uh, and it, uh, yeah, it, it is a, uh, it is a risk-taking enterprise, there's no doubt about it. It's not quite that bad, though. Uh, the beauty of being able to, to structure the investment in a case in, a, in an infinite number of ways is that you uh, can do a pretty good job um, with, with our experience base, uh, anyway, of anticipating the, the twists and turns the case might take uh, and how that might affect its value and uh, the, the plaintiff's feeling about settling the case uh, along the way. And you can build those variables into the cost of capital you're committing. Uh, and the way that capital commitment is structured. I mean, the goal in, in every case is to structure the financing so the, the interests of the plaintiff, the, the party you're funding, uh, and, and the lawyers uh, and the funder are all aligned all the way down the timeline. So uh, if, if, we, if we do things right, we never get to a point where one, you know, one party to the, the financing arrangement really wants to settle and the other party really wants to keep litigating. I mean, that's, when that happens, it's 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 you know, uh, it's it's un unfortunate and can be can be disappointing to somebody. But uh, as I say, we you know uh, have tools for structuring things so that um, things align. Um, and the interests are aligned. And I mean, conceptually, that isn't different from what a contingent fee lawyer 
does when they do a case on a sliding scale, if you think about it. Um, you know, 25% of the case settles early, 33% of the case gets close to trial, and 40% of it goes to verdict. There, there's a, uh, a, a structuring that keeps the contingent fee lawyer's interests aligned with their client, roughly speaking. Uh, and it's, you know, basically, in, in either uh, enterprise, it's basically about creating a win-win outcome along a spectrum of possible paths um, the case can take. Yes, and there are times in the plaintiff's room when despite all that planning, at the end of the mediation, get down to the point of perhaps asking a contingent fee lawyer whether they would consider reducing their fee somewhat in order to get enough money into the plaintiff's pocket to make a deal. Do those conversations take place at the end of mediations as well? Are there calls to the Funders saying, hey, this is the most we can get out of this defendant. Seems like a pretty reasonable deal based on what we've learned today. Uh, can we kind of massage things with you guys to make this deal go down? Does that happen? Uh, that does happen uh, occasionally. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, litigation financiers aren't stupid. I mean, <laughs> If there's if there's a favorable settlement to be gained, uh, you know, uh, and and just saying no on principle would blow it up. That wouldn't be very smart. So uh, certainly uh, that that conversation does happen. Uh, I uh, don't want to venture a comment on how often it leads to uh, any any alteration in the terms of the financing. Uh, but it's you know it's I mean the whole idea is you've got rational economic actors. I, I don't want to give the impression that, that those terms are revisited frequently, but uh, you know it, it has been known to happen. You guys, with all your hundreds and hundreds of years of litigation experience, the big data that you use, you must have ways of structuring things that make you comfortable with letting the plaintiff and its lawyers drive the bus for so much of the litigation process. Can you tell us more about the way that things commonly get structured so that we have a better understanding of that? Yeah, um, yeah, I, uh, um, I mean, there, there, as I say, there are an infinite, infinite number of structures out there, but let me, let me, uh, and, and so many variables in structuring them, but let me, uh, let me give you an example. And to keep it simple, let's just talk about kind of one of the, one of the, uh, the levers we have or one of the tools we have uh, in structuring financing to um, keep keep the interests aligned and you know make make for a win-win uh, experience. Uh, so let's let's uh, keep it simple and just talk about uh, what I would call the quantum variable, the relationship between the size of the case, in other words, the, the amount of damages uh, in issue, and the size of the investment uh, the funder is being asked to make. Um, funders usually have uh, some rule of thumb uh, about that ratio because they want to ensure uh, that there's enough room in, in the financing uh, agreement for the plaintiff to settle the case for less than 100 cents on the dollar uh, and still have a favorable recovery after paying the funder its share. You don't want somebody concluding that, well, we just have to take this case to trial rather than settle it because that's the only way that we're going to see a dime uh, out, of, out of the case after paying the financing expense. That, that obviously is not a situation that, that uh, is, is, is healthy. So, um, so let's, uh, let's work through a little example. Let's suppose that for uh, cases of a certain risk profile, pick, pick a kind of case, an antitrust case or a, a breach of contract case, or whatever. Uh, suppose that for, for cases with, in, in that sort of risk bucket, uh, a funder is looking to get its investment back plus two times that investment. That's, that's its target return on cases like that. So uh, in, in that scenario, uh, the funder is not going to invest $4 million in legal fee in a case that only has, say, $15 million in provable damages. To do the simple math, that case would have to settle for over $12 million before the plaintiff started to recover any net proceeds, right? The funder gets back its $4 million plus a two, two times multiple of that, so that's eight for a total of 12. So at a $12 million settlement, the, the funder has taken 100% of the proceeds and the, and the plaintiff has received nothing. Uh, so, you know, in contrast, that funder might happily take that $4 million and put it into a case that's got $50 million in uh, 
provable damages. Because on the same terms, you know, the investment back plus plus two times that investment, the plaintiff would end up with a lion's share of the recovery even if that case settled for only $25 million or 50 cents on the dollar. Uh, the funder, again, would get its $4 million investment back, would get its $8 million premium, but the plaintiff would still walk away with a net of $13 million. So, um, you know, that's, that's one, one tool we have among many for structuring the financing in a way that keeps everybody's incentives aligned and leaves hopefully everybody happy with, a, with the outcome across a range of outcomes. But at the same time, you have to make sure that you're putting enough money into the case to make sure that it can be appropriately prosecuted. Absolutely. And uh, we, you know, one of the first things that we ask for when we're vetting the case uh, is what's the budget? Uh, what's the, the budget for, for fees and expenses through trial? We don't, uh, we don't assume that the case is going to settle short of trial. We uh, look at the case and say, what's it going to take to take this case all the way to verdict and judgment, uh, if that's what we have to do? And we spend a great deal of time uh, kicking the tires and uh, playing devil's advocate on the legal budgets, because the legal budget is generally you know, the, the amount of our commitment. And uh, we, uh, at least at Burford, when, when we make that commitment to fund a case up to that amount, we do it in the, in the absolute expectation that that is going to be our investment in the case uh, and that we're not going to uh, you know, see somebody run through uh, the $10 million we put down and then come back and ask for another five. So uh, we spend a lot of time, we have a lot of experience uh, since most, most, of our, most of our underwriters take a lot of vets. Uh, we, uh, we know what legal bills look like, you know, what, what they're made up of. Uh, we know uh, how they can be uh, reduced, how they can be increased. And we spend a great deal of time uh, picking apart legal budgets and adjusting, uh, you know, the, the amount of the investment requested uh, to, to be realistic so that we don't find ourselves in that situation where the, the you know, the kettle is boiled dry before the tea is made. Huh. Are, are there other ways that you all help litigants help plaintiffs share or transfer legal risks? So I'd say the, besides financing uh, <clears throat> legal expense uh, in, in, in pursuing litigation, I'd say the other principal uh, thing we do is monetize, it's basically monetize claims. That is uh, uh, to uh, underwrite the risk the litigant won't end up with any recovery after uh, it, it has pursued a case uh, to a conclusion. Uh, we call that uh, monetizing the claim. We'll pay uh, a claimant, uh, the would-be or current plaintiff, a sum of money, uh, which it's entitled to use as it sees fit. It, if it's not financing the, the, the legal uh, legal spend, it can pay its lawyers with the money. Uh, if it's uh, just you know, if it's got a contingent fee deal with the lawyers already, but it wants some cash in hand to go spend on R and D or marketing or uh, building a new plant or something like that, it can use the money to do that. Uh, we will uh, pay it uh, a lump sum at the, at the point we enter the case, which may be at the beginning of the case or it may be somewhere in, in the course of the proceedings. And uh, as with uh, uh, legal expenses, we finance, we'll recover that money plus our premium if and when the case eventually produces uh, proceeds. Um, or uh, if, we're, if we're working with a law firm, that's working on a contingent basis. Uh, we'll pay the law firm uh, a lump sum up front uh, and get our recovery uh, out of uh, the fee that it ultimately receives for that case when it resolves. So the contingent lawyer has a 33% interest in a case that is not gonna uh, resolve for, for three or four years. Uh, we may monetize, but, but as we'll then get 33% of whatever the recovery is, we will monetize a portion of that 33% recovery today, and the lawyer can go invest in some new cases or buy a beach house or pay the associates or, or what have you. Well, when you monetize the claim and give the plaintiff itself a sum of money, you expect that plaintiff to use the money to litigate the case, right? Uh, well, not necessarily. Uh, I mean, there's there's no there's no law that says you have that only impecunious uh, litigants monetize their claims. Sometimes, uh, a, you know, a well-heeled company may be looking at a hundred million dollar recovery, but it's four years down the line, and they may say, well, you know, uh, looking at the capital markets, we think 
the, 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 the best money deal we can get today is to monetize a portion of that recovery uh, with a litigation funder rather than you know issuing a note or uh, uh, you know calling up a, uh, calling down our bank line or whatever that's that's the most favorable uh, terms on which we can get some money today uh, on on the claim that will pay off uh, five years from now so you want some assurance the claim is actually prosecuted I would assume oh well absolutely uh, and I mean they're essentially the we, we, we do the same diligence and we require the same um, um, diligence on the part of the plaintiff in pursuing the case. I, the, the, and again, it's, uh, it, it's all about aligning terms. Uh, if, we, if we have purchased the entire claim, which we occasionally do, but is, is, not, uh, is not our, our principal activity, uh, you know, and, and, and actually buy the chosen action, that, that's a separate kind of transaction. But if we're monetizing a portion of someone's recovery, um, they, they, they think they're going to make they're going to hit 500 million dollars on an antitrust case and we're monetizing 75 million dollars of it today uh you know ideally there's enough headroom in there again uh that they will have all the incentive they need to continue pursuing the case because they will keep the rest of the upside that they didn't monetize with us at the end of the case uh if 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 we're concerned about that uh then you know, we have to start looking at other levers we can we can pull to make sure that the incentives are aligned because obviously we don't want somebody carrying our water who doesn't want to carry water. So in those cases, you try to ensure that the plaintiff still has the incentive in litigating or coming to a mediation still has the incentive to fight hard and fight fair and maximize its recovery for the benefit of everybody. We, we never want our counterparty to not be excited at the prospect of recovering on its claim. And uh, as I say, we spend a great deal of effort structuring the financing to make sure that it is always excited about the prospect of getting more rather than less on that claim. When do people do this, Andy? Do they come to you before a lawsuit is filed? Do they come to you with a proposed complaint? Do they come to you right before they have to pay tons of money to experts for discovery, uh, preparation of reports. What's the timing of it all? Litigation financiers fund cases all along the timeline from before they're ever filed uh, to uh, when they are on appeal. And even when they're in the Supreme Court of the United States, if it comes to that. Um, there are, uh, as long as there is legal risk in, in, in the in the equation, uh, there is legal risk that can be uh, shifted and financed. So um, we are we are uh, approached about financing cases all along the spectrum. We have many cases before they're filed. Uh, of course, people are saying, you know, I've, I've got a I've got a good case here. Uh, my lawyers tell me it's great, but before I commit to, you know, fi filing the filing the case, I I need to know uh, who's going to pay for this. But uh, you know. Very regularly, we get uh, inquiries about cases that have been filed and have uh, survived a motion to dismiss, for example. That's an important milestone in the life of, of many cases. And a case that we might not be interested in financing pre-filing because we have questions about the, uh, the court's uh, uh, willingness to let it proceed uh, may be answered by a ruling on a motion to dismiss. And uh, we have financed many cases that we initially declined, uh, you know, uh, after taking a second look at them as they moved through the process a little bit. Um, part, a party may come to us after they have uh, defeated the defendant's summary judgment motion and say, the court's given me a, a license to try this case. Uh, and of course, uh, that, you know, generally speaking, um, may, may significantly alter the settlement uh, value of that case and the settlement dynamic. And we may be interested in financing a case at that stage. And, um, of course, as you go down the timeline and these, these milestones are passed, uh, the, the good news for the plaintiff uh, is uh, since the, the, the number of variables in the, in the mix is, is decreasing and the number of uncertainties and the number of, of ways they can lose the case is being reduced, the risk is decreasing and that may mean that the capital to continue to fight is available on, uh, you know, on cheaper terms because the, the risk is lower. And, we, and just to finish the thought, I mean, we, 
we uh, we will often finance cases after uh, after a verdict, uh, and uh, uh, you know somebody just says, "Well, I I just I just want a sixty million dollar judgment." Uh, the defendant's now telling me that they're going to dance me around in the court of appeal for the next four years. Uh, and I got to hire the best appellate lawyers to go all the way to the United States Supreme Court if necessary. So finance that and or will you monetize my judgment, please? Uh, and uh, we are always excited to look at the propositions like that, uh, which, again, have, you know, a lot of the a lot of the riskiness baked out of them at that point on the uh, on the litigation timeline. Well, let's talk about some of the criticisms you read regarding litigation funding. Uh, there are people who say that there's a dark side to making capital available in this way because it encourages the pursuit of opportunistic claims by people who don't have much to lose. What about that? And, and the answer uh, sort of lies in, in the fact that the premise of that question is, uh, is I think, obviously false. Uh, you know, uh, you talk about a case where somebody has nothing to lose. Well, uh, there aren't many cases like that in the world. Um, you know, if, if, uh, if the plaintiff is, is paying a lawyer to file it, then by definition, the plaintiff has something to lose. If a contingent fee lawyer is taking the case uh, and not going to get paid unless there's a recovery, the contingent fee lawyer has something to lose. And uh, if, a, if a financier is, uh, is financing the case, then obviously it has something to lose. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit of a... Of a, of a a false, false query. But, uh, you know, if, if, if more generally speaking, um, the, the notion that uh, the availability of litigation finance uh, somehow uh, promotes uh, the, uh, the, the filing of meritless claims, I, I think is, um, is, is really pretty baseless. If you, if you showed me a legal financier who invests in cases that it thinks are going to lose or are pretty likely to lose, then I'll show you somebody who's going to be in business for about 10 minutes and isn't going to have much luck raising any capital to invest. Uh, I mean, nobody uh, who is a, is a sane person, uh, no economic actor acting rationally, is going to invest in propositions that it honestly thinks are losers. Uh, and indeed, if anything, you know, legal finance adds, uh, uh, adds a layer of quality assurance um, that a system with only uh, plaintiffs and lawyers in it doesn't have. It, it, about it, uh, getting a, um, a professional investor to add a, a layer of review to a case before it's filed or before it's pursued further uh, is one way to discourage people from investing money uh, in, in cases that, uh, that are weak. So um, uh, it's, it's just, uh, you know, I, I think a, 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 a false, uh, a, a straw man argument where there's not even a straw man there. Litigation finance, uh, to the to the extent that it's it's uh, tarred as using other people's money to prosecute, you know, meritless claims they don't have the the the, the guts to prosecute themselves. I mean, that's what contingent fee contingent fee lawyering is. And you know, the only difference is is that I as I said earlier, we sort of decoupled or split the the lawyering part from the financing part of what the classic contingent fee lawyer does. Nobody's seriously in any way calling for the abolition of contingent fee lawyering on the ground that it gives plaintiffs nothing to lose when they sue. Uh, you know, we trust that when lawyers file cases, uh, at least lawyers who want to make a living at it and not just cause trouble, uh, we trust those lawyers to vet cases before you invest in them. And, um, you know, why wouldn't you trust other lawyers who can raise capital uh, and vet cases to do the same thing before they invest uh, you know, the public or their shareholders' money? Um, so, I, you know, I, I do think that's kind of an easy critique to, to me. Andy, this is really a fascinating to what litigation funding is and what it isn't. Before we conclude this part of the interview and open it up to questions and answers from our audience, do you have any parting thoughts for mediators in particular, as well as lawyers and parties uh, participating in mediation? How can and should we adapt the growing role of litigation funding in, lit in the litigation process. Yeah, well, let me let me give you a uh, a handful, or maybe a part of a second hand, uh, also full of, of takeaways uh, from from this discussion. Uh, first, don't don't assume that the plaintiff or the plaintiff's lawyer can be out resourced. 
uh, either the lawyer or the or the, uh, the plaintiff themselves may be taking risk or uh, a major portion of the risk on the case. So be, be wary of making that assumption. Likewise, don't assume that you can accurately assess the plaintiff's or its lawyer's sensitivity to spending cash uh, on lawyers uh, or on its legal spend hitting its bottom line. Uh, no matter what the, the papers uh, and the rest DC filings say about a, a party or their lawyer's financial situation and prospects, they may not have any, uh, any sensitivity like that because it's not their cash being spent to prosecute the case. Uh, third, don't assume you can drive a wedge between the plaintiff and their lawyer uh, by, by, by economic means. Their cost sensitivity and their uh, risk tolerance may be even more closely aligned than it usually is if there's a, if there's a litigation financier in the mix. A fourth, don't waste your time in mediation arguing about whether there's a funder involved behind the scenes, and if so, whether they should be present at the mediation. Um, if they shouldn't, they don't need to be, and they won't be. Um, next, if you if you think the plan is financed, don't assume you can figure out how the funding might be altering their settlement goals or strategy. Uh, and that's because there's no, as we talked about, there's no one standard deal structure to a litigation financing. You're never going to be able to guess whether or how financing might play into a plaintiff's willingness to settle at a particular number at a particular, at a particular time. So don't, don't waste your time trying to figure that out. Uh, and finally, um, remember, as we were just discussing, uh, legal finance can enter the picture at any point along the case timeline from before the case was filed so when they, and while it's pending, uh, and while it's on appeal, and while a cert petition is pending, and, and beyond even. So don't assume that a case that could have settled for X dollars in the middle of discovery last year is settleable for X dollars a year or two later, because the plaintiff may have gained some staying power it didn't have before. Uh, in short, um, question the assumptions you have traditionally made when you go into a mediation. Just great. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate it very much. We have just one minute left. One quick question in the chat. Are there issues about waiving privilege when the lawyers or the plaintiffs discuss confidential matters with you, or representatives of the litigation funder? Yeah, uh, a, a quick answer uh, uh, on which uh, volumes have been written, but the, the, the net of the volumes have been written is uh, courts have, have generally recognized uh, uh, work product protection for discussions uh, with litigation funders, uh, and uh, some courts have also uh, indicated that that uh, there's no waiver of the privilege uh, on, uh, on on various grounds. But uh, essentially, uh, because litigation uh, financing transactions are are pretty tightly documented at the front end uh, to uh, to reflect that the parties intend them to be confidential. Um, as, as long as there's a confidential, confidentiality agreement entered into at the outset, uh, courts, uh, you know, quite overwhelmingly uh, rule that there's no waiver of, of uh, the confidentiality of those discussions, either with respect to negotiating the financing or to uh, uh, managing, managing the case going forward once it's financed. Okay. There's, there's quite a lot written on that out there. Okay, our time is up. Andy Lundberg of Burford Capital, thank you so much for your support of the Will Work for Food project. Thank to you very of, much, Jeff, for the opportunity. To all, to, to all who've been listening and watching, please support the LA Regional Food Bank. That's www.lafoodbank.org if you are in a position to do so. We appreciate everyone's participation and contributions very much. Natalie, thank you for organizing this great project back in 2020. And with that, my friends, we are complete.